58,306 days ago, the then President of the United States of America, Abraham Lincoln, delivered what some have called the most powerful statement uttered in the English language with the Gettysburg Address. And nearly 148 years later, to the day, the office gave us this. All I had for breakfast was oatmeal, yogurt, um, coffee, orange juice, and toast. Two poached eggs, and then a half a sandwich on the bus. I... Hey everyone, I'm Chris, again with no glasses. Don't worry, they're in the mail. And I'm reviewing every episode of The Office ever, and today we're looking at Gettysburg. America's bloodiest battle. This is kind of a universally panned episode, and I'm excited to jump into it with you all. Andy and Robert are trying to rally the troops with very different tactics. Dwight learns some foundational insights about the history of his family and property, and things get kind of real. DM does GB mean something kind of sexual. So let's go. Come and get it. Who's going to get the flag? We got a flag right here. Woohoo! I understand nothing. To me, the end of the series is so good that sometimes you just have to suffer through some of these low points. Obviously, we all want to die, but we have to get through this, so Gabe? And I'm going to do my best here to not be a contrarian or apologist for this episode. I tend to find stuff I love in all of these, and it's The Office. But we're going to get into that. Okay, so Gettysburg's cold opening begins in the conference room with Gabe Wad, Gabe Wad reading through some binder material. I have to sit through stuff like this all the time, but it's never in person like this. It's just those terrible website things that make you watch videos, answer the questions, all that stuff. But Jim and Pam have an escape plan, which as she explains, I know it's wrong to fake going into labor just to get out of things, but sometimes it's necessary. Should I have corn dogs? I mean, I'm going into labor. But the couple's ploy is busted but the rest of the staff didn't know that Pamela had an ace up her sleeve. That is until she drops the ball. Good luck! False alarm. Ball droppings can be beautiful. The real episode begins with Andy rallying his troops onto a bus for a quick two hour hop over to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Now, if you're not from the US and you didn't have to sit through multiple US history classes throughout your time in school, then you might be a little lost on this whole episode. Maybe not. But back in the day, we had a little bit of a disagreement over states' rights and federal overreach. Those rights that the states wanted to hang on to was predominantly regarding the ownership of human beings as slaves, and whether the federal government had the ability to tank the nation's economy by setting free millions of human beings who happened to create the foundation of labor in the South. So this was a complex debate with like, a very clear right and wrong, but this debate waged so hard that some states seceded from the Union, and then a war was fought to rein them back in. While the Northern Union armies were initially fought back further north than anyone was comfortable with at the time, battles like Gettysburg resulted in significant victories for the Northern ranks and helped turn the tide of the war, ultimately getting that W in April of 1865. Woohoo! This is just the Mulverine retelling of the war in about 150 words. It's obviously a very complex and nuanced thing. And some people make this their entire personality. And I get that there's nuance that people can dive into, but you know, this episode doesn't actually require any of that background knowledge. The setting and the history there within seem to just really be there to prop two very specific jokes rather than creating anything uniquely special. So I'm not going to spend any more time in it. I just wanted to share a little bit of that as some of it was necessary context to understand just how baffling this episode is. So while the writers didn't seem to make much use of the setting, Andy is super hyped. You could see it in his recruitment speech. Charge! <laughs> You can hear it on the bus. All right, guys, a little foreplay before we do it. By the way, this might be my favorite Phyllis line of all time. You know, I just got Limitless on my iPad. I bet I could get it on the TV. Oh, isn't that the one where the guy becomes Limitless? And Andy's intensity for the trip is shown with the amount of preparation that he put into this day. Sign says uh, begin tour here. Unless you're going on the very specially created and meticulously researched Andy Bernard tour. A C plot quickly diverges from the primary story in which Dwight is convinced due to like legacy storytelling, I guess, that Shroot Farms held a bloody scrimmage which holds the honor, honor of the most Northern battle 
in the Civil War. Gettysburg? Hmm, could be interesting. Second most northern battle in the Civil War. Actually, it is the northernmost. Ha! Was it, however, the most northern battle of the Civil War? Not yes, by yes, a long shot! No. Yes, no! Yes, yes! Can you tell us about the Battle of Schrute Farms? Oh, I haven't heard of that one. Really? Okay, follow-up question. How much are they paying you to keep your mouth shut? Which I don't think that Gettysburg is even considered the most northern battle in the Civil War, much to actually's dismay. Actually? The B-plot quickly sets up as well. When Robert California shows up to mostly losers left in the branch, he sets up an innovation challenge in which the staff are asked to bring their game-changing ideas to the conference room. Game changers. Changes to the game such that the game can never be played the same way again. Really, this goes about as well as you'd expect with pretty on-brand performances from the likes of Ryan, Stanley, and Kevin. Origami. What? In the African-American community. No. They have the chocolate chip cookies in the A1 spot, but the real best spot is D4, right? That's where the eyes go. Back at Gettysburg, Andy takes the staff on his own makeshift tour, which is comprised of miles of walking, breaks for lunch, games, and teachable moments. Business is war. Kind of like a beach games vibe going on without the good writing. <laughs> 14 strangers who work together, but only one survivor. What? And no stakes. Where's my steak? Gabe diverges at this point from the pack and is coerced into a performance of the life of Abraham Lincoln, which honestly he kills. I guess the Lincoln assassination is now able to be joked about. The Lincoln assassination just recently became funny. I need to see this play like I need a hole in the head. I need her, like I need a hole in the head. With Zach doing his magic in the open air theater, Dwight, Aaron, and Oscar are equally sidetracked by a local historian who knows something of Schrute Farm's place in the Civil War, which leads to this fantastic bit. I like to think of Schrute Farm as uh, the underground railroad for the sensitive and fabulous. Wow, this is so much better than the story you made up. Back at the office, Kevin's idea about prioritizing product placement in the vending machines is reinterpreted by Bobby to mean something relevant to paper. And he's very fascinated with Kevin's mind. You're an accountant. Those bogus prospectuses must drive you insane. Yes, I am an accountant. Until Ryan, jealous of Kevin getting Robert's attention, undeservedly, gets Kevin to out himself as an idiot. At the end of the week, you have a free Big Mac. And you love it even more because you made it with your own hands. Meanwhile, the remaining staff with Andy is getting tired from their two hour drive, plus several mile hike, and they begin to drop like flies. That's two miles if you incorporate the walk pack. Jim, Andy, and Daryl have a heart-to-heart -to, -heart to wrap up this episode. And that's about all she wrote. So let's dive into the deeper meaning. What does a bean mean? Someone please explain it to Kevin. This is the worst. <laughs> Yeah, this episode's a mess. I thought about this for more than a week now, which is way more than what I normally put into these episodes. Sorry for anyone who thought I'd spend weeks working on these. Maybe for the first time in the history of this series with a real episode of The Office, this is like the 160th episode, I for real can't come up with a single cohesive unifying theme for this episode. Now, the only time that this has happened so far was with the banker. I don't know. You, you don't know. But this is a real episode. And I mean, Robert and Andy are both trying to inspire their staff and lead their people, but the plot lines end essentially empty, inconsequential, and worst of all, they're like a waste of time. And the plot demands that we conclude that they're a waste of time. It really feels like the writer started with the premise of, you know what would be awesome? We should make a joke that Zach Woods kind of looks like Abe Lincoln. And they put that on their wall with all of their jokes. And then while planning season eight, somebody said, hey, let's make an episode about this. And then somebody else said, where's Gettysburg? Gettysburg, where is that? It's right here in PA. 
I'm pretty sure this episode probably took multiple forms throughout its creation. I'm guessing the episode was planned to be filmed entirely on location at Woodley Park in Van Nuys with all of the staff being present. But with Fisher's looming pregnancy, this is her last episode of the season, and the need to fit James Spader into another episode this season, those probably all were at work to create these diverging plot lines, and, you know, the rest is history. And while Gettysburg does deliver some pizzazz along the way, the whole episode doesn't exactly have anything to say at all. Robert failing to see that Kevin is the village idiot from the multiple interactions he's had with the guy. The thing that I like about Elmo is the tickling. Only to realize at the end of this one that Kevin is the village idiot. It was just actually cookies the whole time. It just feels useless. It's a fine bit, like it's funny, but in context of the season, it doesn't make a ton of sense. And this revelation should impact Robert. What would have been interesting is to see Robert unraveling the way that he judges people. Instead, it just ends. On the flip side, Andy's revelation in the final moments of this episode completely washes away the entire reason for going to Gettysburg in the first place. I wanted my team to be like this army and I was their general, but I guess it's really just more like there are people who work in an office and I'm their manager. Which doesn't make any of what happened substantial. Even the emotional climax with Andy, Jim, and Daryl is just retread on what we've already seen several times in season eight. Now, an on the surface deeper meaning can be trite and give the vibe of being really too PSA-ish. And I've discussed in the past that I think writers like Mindy Kaling like to write these character conflicts and chaotic episodes full of cringe comedy. And, you know, she strays away from doing any kind of surface level statements in an episode. But her episodes don't lack a deeper meaning, quite the opposite. They're rich with meaning, and they make the hunt for that deeper meaning all the more engaging. But that's not the case here. This episode was written by Robert Padnick, and he's had quite the career, and I'm not trying to throw shade at anybody. But I don't think that this episode is made up of the same stuff that the series has been comprised of over the last several years. I realized this was not a good episode, during this exchange with Aaron Dwight and Oscar. No, 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 you're filling her head with nonsense. You and the history books, I'm telling the truth. Interesting. There's something about the way that Rain's reading his lines here that make the sequence feel like this was nowhere near the best performance that these actors could give. Was it the second most Northern? Sure, I will cede it was the second most Northern Aaron. most battle. Was it the northernmost? No. Now maybe it's the heat, Maybe it's being tired from being on location. Maybe it's the direction, or maybe it's all of these on location lines were probably ADR'd in studio. Maybe it's just the writing that was lacking, or maybe it's a combination of all of those, but something is off. Get out of here! Get out of here! Now, Bob Vance once told me that he feels like the talented writers of the early seasons of The Office wrote comedy in the situations that these characters would have with each other. The jokes were inherent, underplayed and pretty low key, but that was always his assessment of why it worked so well. But over time, with the changes in the writer's room, they started writing jokes for the characters to recite. And this changed the fabric of the show from cringe situational comedy to, ha, do you remember that thing that Kevin said that one time that was funny? Uh, the man tree puts its penis. Okay. That concept is very much on display in the Gettysburg episode. Seemingly crafting this entire episode around two or three bits makes 80% of this episode feel like filler just to get to those bits. But the 20% that's here, I mean, it's not really good enough to compensate. Thing is, there's so much talent on set and in the back rooms of the office. The people who are creating this show are so good at their jobs that even episodes like this can have fantastic lines in it. Fun fact, in France, they call Limitless the man with many capabilities. My favorite parts of Gettysburg are at the office and the whole Shroot Farms reversal thing, that's all good stuff. And of course, the Lincoln bit is pretty funny. Bang! <laughs> Do so. Yeah. But none of it is enough to save the episode from getting a one out of five from me. That was bad. But that's just what I think about Gettysburg. I can't wait to hear your thoughts in the comments. 
please let me know. I also can't wait to get into the office again next week with Mrs. California, especially since I've had a crush on Miss Tierney since the mid-90s. So with that, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.